evening, board members, Mr. Gonzalez, and district staff. The time is 6.02 p.m. on this, the seventh day of March, 2023, and I call this board workshop of the United Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. The following board members are present. Please state your name. Frank Castillo, present. Alisa Olivero is present. I believe we have Michelle Molina present. Maybe I started too soon. I think they're in the back, but we can proceed once okay, they perfect. can announce a quorum. Okay, so we do we do have a quorum. Well, Gilbert, when they're Gilbert present, we can announce the quorum for the record. Sorry? So okay. I do I say we have a quorum or we don't have a quorum? We don't have a quorum present. Okay, so okay. okay. So let the we 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 go. There we go. We have one. Okay, okay, perfect. Michelle, you complicated the meeting. <laughs> Come on in. Okay. Michelle Molina for the record. Um, let the record show that a quorum of board members is present. Gilbert Aguilar is present as well. That this workshop has been duly called and that notice of this workshop has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meeting Act. If everybody could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Agenda item four, informational items, 4A, budget 2023-2024 update. Ms. Benavides? Um, Sam and I are gonna do a, a duet here. Uh, I'll do part of the presentation, he's gonna do the other half. Well, actually I'm gonna start it and he's gonna go, and, well you'll see us with the one. Okay, <laughs> so Sam hit it. Uh, we're gonna, we, we felt it was time to kind of bring y'all an update on where we are in current year budget. Enrollment's been such an issue. And, uh, you know, as we adopted a budget last year that had a $25 million deficit, I mean, that was of a concern to everybody. And so we're gonna bring you some updated numbers and then we're gonna talk about 2024, the budget 2024, knowing that there's a lot of bills filed right now that hopefully will help us, some are gonna hurt us, but uh, hopefully we'll bring you a good update as, as we're going along. So, um, so I know this is really tiny, but I just kind of wanted to share the history of our moment with, with the board. Um, we, we divided it, you know, pre-pandemic, that was five years ago. We were at 43,278. Uh, five years later, in 2023, we were at 41,381. We lost, if you look at the change column, that from that year, pre-pandemic, to our current year, we've lost about almost 1,400 elementary students. It's not the same elementary students because it was five years ago, right? But we're down 1,400 elementary students. We're down about 400 middle school students. And we're down about 125 high school students. In total, almost 1,900 students, lower than we were five years ago. And so you all know that enrollment attendance drives a lot of our revenue. And so that is a concern. Of course, the crazy years of the pandemic, um, virtual, you know, 2021, we had 97% of our students. We were 41,902, but they were all pretty much on remote. But TA let us have them on remote. <coughs> Come 21, 22, TA said, no, everybody goes in face to face. And I think that's the year where our parents hesitated to send in some of their, their students, some of their kids, right? And then next, the following year, which is this year, I think that's where we were pleasantly surprised. We loved having our students back in our classrooms. And that's where we saw a pretty big jump in, um, in our enrollment from what we projected. We tried to be conservative when we did this year's budget, but we were pleasantly surprised that that many kids uh, that, more, that many more kids showed up. So uh, what I put there was that almost an additional 1,500 elementary students uh, more showed up than what we had projected. Thus, class size waivers, even though we added about eight to 10 teachers, you know, it was a very crazy first six weeks of school this past year. 
So again, this is gonna lead to the discussion of enrollment for the new year because we wanna be conservative, but we also kinda of wanna be realist about what we need to project. So um, our projected enrollment for this year was the 39,389. Our enrollment at 1028, that's kind of a date we call snapshot. It's the end of our second six weeks. Uh, we were at 41,373. 1984 more students, more than projected. Almost 1,500 of those were elementary students. And so what we plan to do as we're building this year's, this coming year's budget and getting ready for next year, we're gonna work closely with the campuses to encourage online student registration. Uh, we think that gives us a very good idea of what kids are coming back to our district. And we're gonna, we're gonna have summer registration at different sites to encourage any new students that wanna come in and already register and not wait for that first day of school or the week before so that we can really get an idea of what uh, the number of kids we're gonna be having on our campus. That's a great idea. Okay, okay now I'm gonna turn it over to Sam. Good evening, Ms. Olivares, Board of Trustees. Um, I'm gonna go over the numbers that we are working with for this current fiscal year. But then taking back when we approved the budget, we adopted a budget of state revenue of 151.8 million. At that time, we projected enrollment to be 39,389 students. We had a budgeted ADA at 94%, which gave us 37,030 students for our average state attendance, which is what we get funded off of. Right now, we're sitting at an actual enrollment of 41,373 students. We are expecting to end the year at 37,724 average daily attendance. So our current average daily attendance is 91.2%. This site's kind of tricky because we do expect to have $6.4 million more in state funding. But if you notice that our enrollment went up, and if our enrollment would have stayed at our budget at 94%, we'd be looking at an $11 million gain. But because our, our average daily attendance is what we get funded by dropped from 94 to 91, we're netting a $6.4 million gain, which is still positive, but that's how important average daily attendance is in, in state funding right now. We'll see what the current legislative <coughs> is. If I may, Mr. Flores, yes. for the record, uh, and, and us going to our next school alliance meetings in the region, this is, a, is not a problem that just you always have, this is statewide. So what's happening with the population across the state, because we're going face to face, and because of COVID, any kind of a sneeze, runny nose, parents not sending the kids to school. That's what's happening. So this is why we're fighting for House Bill 30, which goes back to getting the funding as far as enrollment as versus ADA. And I understand we're only one of six districts in the country that, I'm sorry, six states in, in, our, in, in the U.S. that has this. So hopefully, with House Bill 30, it'll pass, it'll be a big change for us. That's what we're hoping for. What about also, um, I know we've talked about this in the past, about possibly lobbying for, um, at one point we were talking about an online virtual high school or any type of option for parents. Because a lot, of, maybe not all of those elementary students that we lost, um, because that's where you see the bulk of them, are being homeschooled. And for whatever reason, they just didn't want to bring them back into the classroom. And, and I know at one point they can sit, they entertain the possibility of maybe a high school, but I think there needs to be, we're competing with, you know, we're competing with these online high schools, uh, online schools, because it's elementary, elementary, middle school, and high school. They, they offer the gambit of, of grades. That's where competition is right now, which I imagine they're charter schools. I don't know how they do it, but has there been any lobbying that you've heard of for that? Yeah, I, I think there is some bills filed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just going to depend, and we can start following them closer, and we can get some information from our Texas. But it's not one of your hot bills. It's not the right. one. Right. So no. uh, they do talk about Texas virtual schools. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, it's it's uh, I don't want to say controlled. It's kind of you have to register with with TEA, and you know. But it is something worth looking at, especially <laughs> if they're going to expand it. Um, it wasn't something as easy as like, okay, you get a, a right. virtual school. Right. So it is something we could be looking into and, and get with our alliances to see what can work well Kind of sort of like what we have, because um, I talked about the Jose Valdez model that LASD has, where they have all of the at-risk students, or even um, not necessarily at-risk grade-wise, but other problems of mental health problems or pregnancies or whatever the case may be that 
places that student at risk for dropping out. And so all they have to do is four hours of mm -hmm. um, Odyssey, I guess, at the mm -hmm. campus. And they can, and they have to also be behind the credits. Right. So they can advance and graduate with their class mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the high school where they belong. Um, and I know there's a lot of flexibility there with, with attendance and with hours of school and what have right. you. I think, I think the approach we've taken, I know Ms. Lindon had brought uh, the past program for LBJ. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, it's been real successful. And I think uh, she, she also brought the one for United South High School. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess with instruction, we can start seeing the results of uh, the participants. and Because you're right, it's a flexible schedule. It's for those kids that maybe work late at night. They come in later and just need the four hours to get the credit. Because yeah, I think that not only helps us fiscally, but it helps us with this new grading system. Because we don't want to, to see any, we don't want anyone to drop out of, out of, out of school. But if there's any possibility of keeping them, then I think that's an option. Yeah. Another thing, I don't know if the state, does the state offer ADA for three-year-olds? Because how does LISD get reimbursed for the three-year-old program? Not at the three-year-old level, but I'm not too sure. Yeah, because I always I always thought that. You know, I've always pushed. Well, our end, we've never seen it. I've never seen that expression. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I'm just curious if you could ask someone at LISD if they get paid for the three-year-olds. Yes. Or if it's just something that they do for free for the community. Yes. yes. Another major component in, in funding for USD is, is local property values. Um, just take it back again when we adopted the budget. Our m &O rate um, is 85 cents. Our INS rate is just under 17 cents. We have a total adopted rate of dollar two. So right now, and we budgeted $203 million in local tax collection. Right now, we're at a 98.7% collection. We feel that we've done our projections. Our taxpayers are, are paying their, their, their tax statements. And we feel we're going to collect the full $203 million, so a good note on, on tax collections. What's surprising is I know that the Fed keeps raising the interest rate, but that has helped us out on our interest income. Mm -hmm. We budgeted 650000 because rates back then were less than um, 1%. Now they're hovering above 4%. And so we, we already have the majority of this $2.8 million coming in, but we expect to get about $2.8 million in interest income. So that will help offset um, some of the money that, when you remember, we adopted the budget. It was a deficit budget. But before we get to that slide, we look at the payroll, I mean, we look at the expenditures. You, last year at the same time, we brought you the vacancies that we're saving for vacancies, and it was $5 million. Now we're at $6.5 million savings in, in vacancies. We still have the, the health insurance shortfall that we have every year, 3 to $4 million. It's still there. Pharmaceuticals is really driving this deficit. It's just a tough thing to catch up on with, with the pharmaceuticals and how the price of the pharmaceuticals is, is, is skyrocketing. But we have this in our numbers, we're anticipating it, we're preparing for it. So in summary, if you remember, we adopted a $25 million deficit budget. But with these savings, we think we're going to have a $6.4 million increase in state revenue. We're going to have a $2.2 million increase in interest income. The payroll savings through, through vacancies of $6.5 million. And then the, what we're anticipating in the, the loss in health insurance of $4.5 million, which we will cover with general fund. Um, I came up with this term, budget deficit recovery. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not a, an official accounting term or anything like that, but I think it sells the point that of the 25 million, we're, we're sitting really, really good that we've already, we think we're gonna come up with a 10 million on its own within the budget of this 25 million. And if you remember back then, ESSER funding was gonna help us with this $25 million deficit. We feel now that the ESSER reimbursement is only going to be about $14 million. So hopefully these numbers, are, we think they're pretty solid and we come in and, and we have this budget deficit recovery of about $11 million. So we're no longer looking at this $25 million deficit. It seems like it'll, we're, we're going to be in a better position at the end of the year and we're only going to need uh, $14.4 million coming in from, from ESSER funding. May I add on, on the ESSER funding? Sure. Yes, this is the last year we're going to have it, right? Yes, and I'm just going to elaborate on it right now. Yeah, we'll continue yeah, for a year. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, uh, so we thought we'd talk about ESSER 3. We have been bringing to the board kind of like a one page summary of what we had planned to be using uh, these funds for. So we thought it was time to let you know okay, this is what we've been using the money for, the, act the actual expenditures. 
So last year, they awarded it back in May 2021. We got this notice that we got these monies and then we did, we met with CNI and, and the facilities and different departments to get a plan for the whole ESSER 3 grant, which was 127 million, 127.5 million. So the first year, we spent about a third of it. Uh, there's a breakdown there of 2.1 million in health and safety measures. We ended up adding some positions for, we call them COVID teams. Uh, we, we got four extra registered nurses. We got some health nurse aides uh, across the district. Uh, 9.2 million, uh, meaning students, academic, social, and emotional, and other needs. In this area, we really supported a lot of the instructional technology that was needed for lo uh, learning loss recovery, some reading programs, uh, just different types of technology, mainly in that area. Uh, we, we bought workbooks, we bought uh, tutorials, they were starting tutorials, uh, just everything we needed to try to start getting the kids up to par with, with you know, STAR assessments and, and other academic issues. We also, the mental health support, uh, we were able to hire, I believe it's four LPCs, uh, licensed professional counselors. We kind of hired one for each feeder pattern. Uh, I think it's been working out there. In the, they're under the Director of Guidance and Counseling, so uh, she's the one that directs uh, the services for them or works with them closely. And then the big ticket number there was the 30.1 million in operational continu continuity. And what we did here was we kind of helped our budget. Because we didn't have those kids come in, and yet we had adopted a budget as if 41,000 kids were going to come in, uh, we were able to save uh, 28 million from our budget to cover. Now this coming year we thought we were going to need 25 million, right? So, so you see the pattern there that it has to do with enrollment, attendance, and so this was allowed from ESSER. It was expected by the federal government and the state government to use these funds to kind of help you keep your, your budget and your uh, services you know, parallel, like keep on going, continue what you're doing. And so this was an allowable expense. So it is a big ticket item of the 41.8 million. So come fiscal year 2023, we're projecting to spend 40.2 million and of that, uh, we, were, we went ahead and allocated, and I don't know if you all recall, you all did a, a resolution to pay all full-time employees a one-time payment, and I believe it was, uh, I think it was $2,000? Yeah. Oh, yeah, in October. We paid it in October, and so it totaled up to about $15 million. Um, um, can I stop you real quick? Yes. I've been getting a few, no, I can't say a lot, but a few text messages like, are we getting another one? So there's a rumor going around that there's going to be another one in March or April. And I'm like, I don't I don't ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 it's a rumor. It's a rumor. Yeah, it's a rumor. It, it's, it's a, a rumor, good rumor, but it's, it's not true. It's a rumor, but yeah. I mean, there are strategies that we can talk about, right? Uh, so the other big project that we're working on is the UBC Germicidal Project. Uh, I think we're almost halfway through that project, and I know Mr. Gonzalez has been sending you the email today. Just yes, for yes. Yeah. So that one is almost complete, and then uh, we are going to fund summer school from, from this money. Again, it's to recover learning loss. And this will also help us meet that at least 20% of all this money needs to be for learning loss. So this, this will assure that we're getting there to that 20%. Uh, and then we're gonna, we've are gonna we been in the process of ordering IFP panels for the high schools. The first round of panels that we bought uh, with the bond money, uh, we concentrated on testing grades. And really in the high schools, the only big testing grades are uh, freshmen. They take three, three tests. The sophomores take, I think, one or two, and the juniors take one. And so really the high schools kind of didn't get as many panels as your middle school where they tested every grade, right? They test English, they test math. And so we felt we needed to be, come back and let uh, the high school get some panels. It was allowed by TEA. And we're also doing, doing the earlier grade levels like kinder, first, and second. Uh, we had already done pre-K. We had done third, fourth, and fifth, third testing grades. And so we feel this is going to kind of level the playing field for all those grade levels. So this is a big project that's being worked on right now by Ms. Garcia and her staff and Mr. Bettis and uh, facilities fixing the, the, the panel or the uh, electricity where you have to put the panel. So it's a big project for United ISD. Now, uh, to talk about, well, this, 
to go back to Esther, we still have one more year to start with that. We have through 2024. September 30th, 2024 is the last time we can spend this money. And so we kind of think we've broken it out in thirds that we think we'll have another 40 some million for 2024. For a reason. Yes. Well, uh, for maybe a one time payment, you know, the strategies that I just talked about. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, kind of helping us with the deficit that we saw. The, the $14 million deficit that Mr. Flores talked about. We would get it from S. Okay. So, talking about 23 24, uh, this is a picture that's painting how we all feel right now. Uh, well, I guess me and Sam, this is people, right? Right now, we know the knowns, but the unknowns really outweigh what we know. There are so many bills filed. There's over 5,700 bills filed right now. They're not all public ed, but we're, we're counting on our associations to kind of go through those bills and say, hey, this one impacts you or this one doesn't, you know. There's just too many. Now, the last day for filing bills is Friday, so at least that will stop. But as, as we start going through uh, April and May, we kind of see which bills will last, which ones will stay there that we can start really interpreting. But just to go to what we know right now, uh, the current law formulas, the current law formulas, this is what we know about our current law. That T8 tells us what kind of tax rate to set. They don't let you grow, even though you see all those properties out there growing and everything, it's really not new uh, tax revenue to us because they limit us to a 2.5% growth. Um, we actually grew 34% in our values last year. So they made us reduce our tax rate. So yes, you can. All the homeowners, thank you for that. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> so just to let the board know, uh, because there's so much talk about tax relief at the state level, I mean, I think they're trying to outcompete each other. Uh, but that's good. That's good for our homeowners, right? Uh, we just want to mention to the board. A lot of you all are new to the board. You've never, you know, uh, 1993 that we've had this. I don't think y'all were on the board, right? No. So we've had this homestead exemption since 1993, uh, which means our homeowners get the exemption from the state, but then they also get this 15% local homestead exemption. We had staff calculate, okay, how much are we leaving on the table by offering this? And it's, it's about eight million a year. That's okay. It's a good chunk. But I have to tell you, and I guess I have to admit that I was here in 1993, mm -hmm. and we were a different district then. Mm -hmm. We were not exempting half a billion dollars of values. We don't mm -hmm. want to go back to that. We? We, were, we were exempting, you know, if you think of United ISD back then, all of this wasn't here. Mm -hmm. There were a lot fewer homes. It was more uh, ag, oil and gas, you know, maybe some commercial properties. It was less residents. Now we are in a, a 41,000 student member district, so there's a lot more homes. Yeah. So this is just something, it is the board's, the board has a right to reduce, remove <coughs> this exemption. It's just something that I need to put out there because I have to tell you that we've seen the state come back with more and more tax relief when we have the last two years of it. Yeah, last two years. Yes, we have been doing it since 1993. Like they're just catching up to what we're doing. It's something that, that the board at the time in 1993 was very courageous. They got ahead of the curve in a major way, obviously, since 1993, and they took the initiative back then. United ISD did, and said we're going to offer property tax relief when pretty much the state of Texas was not doing it. And if you look at the group that we're in, the extremely wealthy school districts at United ISD that offer homes at exemption. Every single year that we adopt our budget, the state is penalizing us for offering this homestead exemption. Well, for the last two years, they finally grabbed the torch and said, we're gonna offer property value relief, which is great. But now UISD and the state are offering homestead exemption, and that's fine but they're not giving us credit for offering our local taxpayers homestead, I mean property value or property tax relief. But they're taking the charge down, they're doing it in such a dramatic way that our tax rate fell 15 cents from last year to this year, and it'll probably fall dramatically again. And we're leaving these $8 million at the state every single year. It's not a one-time, if you get rid of this, 
And I'm, we're not saying that, but we just need to drive the point to you that if you get rid of this, that $8 million will come back to United ISD, to the property taxes here that are going to go down by the state because they're leaving the charge now. And we will have $8 million more every single year. It's not just the one time that we get the $8 million and then from there we grow. Every budget from here on out will grow by that $8 million that will pay us in perpetuity. And that's something to think about. That is a lot of money now that the state is leading the charge in property rights. But I'm not sitting up there. I'm sitting down here. There is something that a prior board did also. We were at 20% homestead. And, and they did reduce it by the 5%. What, what are the other local ent entities at? I think uh, I, LIC just has this, but I think they might be at 15%. They might be at 15 yeah. We're one of the only entities. Yes, your, the city the doesn't own the, the, the yeah, it doesn't yeah. own. They yeah. offer like for over 65 or yeah, right. veterans. So we need know, to go advocate for them to offer yeah. homestead exemptions. I'm all for homestead exemptions. Yeah. What I remember reading was that the state is doing this. Are they not doing it also through, I don't know if it's a COVID relief funds from the federal government or ESSER funds from the federal government, but I read that they were going to give it back to taxpayers, the money that they got for this relief through... Um, tax relief to homeowners. And I think that might end for homeowners. So if that ends and then we take away their homestead exemption, taxpayers are gonna be lined up outside the door here. Right, and, and we owe you calculations. We owe you uh, figures. Yeah. You know, figures. Uh, we owe you, hey, here's our value growth in total. We mm -hmm. can bring the pennies down so much and they'll, they'll do, that. like we owe you numbers. Right. It's just to, it was finally time that we haven't brought it up in many, many years, and it's time that, again, now the state is taking the lead on on this issue. Yes. UIC should look at it. Yeah, yeah it's a good exercise for the numbers. You can lower tax to property taxes. Your up. property value is going to increase, and that's. And, and we see a lot of bills, uh, Mr. Montego Mayo, right now at the 10% cap on your home to. It can't go over more than 10%. Right. They're talking about a 5% cap. You know, they, they're trying to find different ways to, to provide relief to taxpayers. But are they uh, talking about an exemption themselves? Yeah, one of, the, one of the bills is, and that's what my thing is, like there's so many bills and there's so many uh, different avenues of providing tax relief that we have to kind of wait, okay, what's gonna survive you know, the next two months until the end of May? Uh, but but we'll go on and uh, I have it further down in another okay. unknown slide I guess this is known so uh, I bring here the basic allotment this is the money they give us per child who attends who sits in, in our seats uh, this is per year and then there's a what they call the co a golden penny yield that actually uh, it's more additional tax revenue it's a very very uh, complicated uh, calculation but if they do increase it it is good news right so I bring these two terms because those are the ones that we focus on whenever we see any school finance bill. If they're gonna increase basic allotment, that helps us with all our student revenue. And if they increase the golden pe uh, penny yield, that also helps us with the money, the taxes we collect. And, and uh, they kind of give you so much money for your tax collection effort. So next, next slide, Sam. And then the other known is the way we calculate, again, revenue, is the average daily attendance. And uh, that's why it's such a big issue right now at the state. But if we were to do a, a, a budget right now, this is the laws that exist, right? What was the amount? You said that if they do away with the, a, with the ADA, what was the amount that we were gonna get back? Was it six mil? I don't remember. It was a previous oh, slide. The, 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 the homestead exemption. No, 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 no. What we're losing because of low attendance that went from oh. 94 to 91. Oh, yes, the 6.4 million that we're getting because more kids came, but our tenants rate right. is still low. So if, they, if, if that bill passes where they don't give us funds based on attendance, we'll get 6 million, oh, okay. the 8 million that we're not getting for tax relief back. Depending, right? Yes. They'll depend on how much they give you per child now. Like right they'll now, lower it yes. or what? Cost per child? We we don't know. Like that that's the unknown. Yeah. That's in the unknown. And and, like, and the state is probably the, the commissioner has mentioned it too many times that getting away from attendance gives districts a, you know that incentive not to have to chase these kids down and come to school. So I think attendance will be a factor. It won't be as important in the formula as it is now. 
they hopefully they give us credit for enrollment, but I'm not too sure they'll ever get away with, uh, give uh, give up the average daily attendance in the calculation. Yeah. Well, well, they're still they're still gonna have to comply. Students still have yeah. to comply with the 90% yeah. rule. They're, they're, they're gonna be 90% percent of the time. So for instruction, they have to be the 90% of the time. Have we considered like putting in a bill to what what I wrote my notes? <clears throat> I just put put in a bill. What was it for? Oh my gosh, I lost my train of thought. Someone else go. I had a thought and it left me. Putting in a bill for something and I forgot what it was. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Well, um, but we can just kind of address the unknowns that kind of uh, have us perplexed right now. Yeah. Oh, okay, it goes back to, to the taxes, to not raising taxes, not taking away the homestead exemption. Have we put in a bill that we shouldn't be docked for offering this exemption to our taxpayers? So it's, what I understand is, and again, 1993 to now, TA, if they budget to kind of give you back half of what you lost, they can do that. But TA hasn't budgeted that amount for years. Why? They just don't put it in their budget. They, they you know, they, uh, we used to get some kind of relief like that, where they'd give mm -hmm. us 50% back, like let's mm -hmm. say that you know we'd get four million dollars back, but they have not budgeted that, and and that's a, a formula right now, like that's their budget, so they haven't budgeted for that line item to give us relief. Mm -hmm. But we could we could we could work through our yes. Texas School Alliance. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just that I'm now just we can share with you how many districts offer this and when they do kind of pass a bill it's really when it's like uh, across the board like it's going to affect a lot of schools and so we could ask them if they can uh, fund that item in their budget because you know like in United Independent School District the highest taxing entity dollar wise as a taxpayer is a school district and everybody knows that and everybody sees that and everybody feels that. So I agree with Mr. Montemayor. He said, look, they're gonna get you one way or another. Our values go up, so it, even if you keep the rate low, you know, there's still, it, we're still paying the homeowner. And so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, that, that's gonna be really, it's gonna be really difficult for me. And so my mortgage payment went up. And so I'm on the appraisal board, right? And I went and I said, okay, well, what's going on here? What happened? It shouldn't have happened. It should have gone down because of this. Well, it ended up being my insurance, my home insurance went up because you're gonna pay somehow. And so they, 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 they did the value of their home and they're saying, oh, well, construction costs have gone up. And so now your insur my insurance went up almost $1,000. And so I'm like, why? And because they're gonna get you one way or another. And I don't wanna be one of those entities that's gonna get the taxpayer. I want United Independent School District to be one of those entities that's gonna help the taxpayer. And I am strongly against taking away the homestead exemption, but I'm open right. to listening to you. Right, and yeah. we feel we do owe you numbers. Yeah. Clear. How many other districts do it? Right. What does it mean to us? I mean, maybe they're gonna say, you know, put us all the same at one point and say, nobody can offer this. I mean, I don't know, yeah. I don't know. And this number, the eight million can increase, right? With more people As sign the up more for values, because a lot of people don't know about the, the tax exempt, they can go sign, sign yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I know and it's and not. The property announced. value does go up. That eight million goes up. It goes up. Less yes. money we're receiving. Yes, it, it would go. Yeah, up potentially with, with receiving, point. right? Potentially yeah. receiving, because yeah. you're not receiving it. No, like no, you're no. you're making budget without it right now. Yeah. But well, potentially, <laughs> like if you got a raise, yeah. you'd get that. And yeah. LISD is doing fifteen percent. Uh, I think that we can we can look, and that could be a future, like you know, serving. item that we bring to you, you know, because it's so many things. So just real quickly, the unknown right now, of course, is what kind of tax rate are they going to allow us to to have? And then there's some several proposed tax cuts. The lieutenant governor Dan Patrick wants to increase the homestead, the state homestead ex exemption from forty thousand to seventy thousand, and then the speaker of the house. Uh, is supporting this House Bill 2, which is the Property Relief <coughs> Act, which would lower school taxes by 28%, and then we got a calculation for that, and it, it's equivalent to about 15 cents. So everybody's pushing property tax relief. They want to okay. use the surplus for property tax relief. So maybe I, a percentage, I, I hear you. Right, right, I hear you. yes. We're getting so, less and less revenue. I hear you, yeah. I hear you. yeah. So the, the next unknown is our property values. 
Uh, we're waiting for Webb County Appraisal District to give us our preliminary, preliminary values. They owe them to us by mid-April. As soon as we have those, we start doing our calculations. And then we'll get our final certified values on July 25th. And just a note there, there to let you know, last year our values grew by 34.7%. And most of it was in the minerals. And then the other unknown is all the legislative changes that are coming, all those 5,700 bills that are being filed. But the things that we're looking at is any, well, as finance people, because the education people are looking at what's affecting them, right? And discipline and safety. But finance, we're looking at anything that would increase our basic allotment. But there's a law right now in the books that says any increase to this basic allotment, 30% of that increase has to be uh, part of a salary increase. And of that 30%, like 75% has to go to teachers, librarians, and counselors. So that's a, that's a current law right now. If they do move it or change it, they might change this law, but this is the way the current law reads as far as a, an increase in basic allotment. And then the, con the golden penny yield, the term that I told you, that if it does go up, we, we could get more revenue. And then other funding being proposed, the safety allotment increase, uh, they curr we currently receive less than $10 per average daily attendance. But there was a Senate Bill 11 filed that would give us a minimum of $15,000 per campus. I don't know how far that will go. That was a Senate bill. I don't know if there's a House, that, a house bill that kind of matches it, but those are things we can keep an eye on. Uh, they talk about cybersecurity allotment, which we, we pay for cybersecurity insurance, right? Uh, and then there's a, a whole separate issue on special education funding, which is the next slide. On special education funding, the reason I put this in, for the TA commissioner to actually be like, I, you know, this is one of his things is he's urging the, the education committee to fund what the special education funding commission report is saying. And pretty much what it's saying is that school districts across the state are underfunded for special, for special ed. And there's a note there, we, we did some calculations and UISD spends about 123% of the special ed funding that we get. That means for, for every dollar we get, we're, we're spending $1.23 on, on special ed services, on special ed staff, and so they know they're under funding in that program. So I thought this was real important because for the TA commissioner to actually talk to the committee about this specific report, I think that might be something we need to keep an eye on. So you think it'll, it'll go? Uh, I'm hoping that we do get an increase in special ed funding. Uh, and then the last slide is just kind of what's going to be coming up. March 10th is the last day for legislative bills to be filed. And then we're going to start our campus staffing meetings in March and April. We're, we're setting up meetings for elementary campuses, uh, March 22nd and 23rd. Uh, we're going to open student online registration in April. Uh, we get those preliminary values in April. And then the, the session ends in May. And then this is when the real work starts. Uh, that's why I put here board budget workshop. It's yeah. going to be important because now we know what rules they have set to us. We can start doing our calculations. We have an idea of what kind of staff we need at the campuses. And so uh, I think June, we probably really need to, like, that roll up your sleeve type and workshop and, and start looking at numbers at that point. And then the rest of the summer where we uh, calculate our tax rates, do a public hearing, and at the August board meeting, hopefully bring you a balanced budget that would be awesome uh, to adopt and a tax rate to adopt. So when do you project to be able to give us um, more information on the homestead exemption numbers? Well, that we can always bring to you because we can bring you what it has, what it, what it has done for, to us, right? Like what, what you're proposing. Yes. We could do different proposals, you know, and, and maybe. Probably the most important thing so you can see, because I know you all are very concerned about the taxpayers, mm -hmm. to break it down to the average house so you can mm -hmm. see that it's not costing a, a taxpayer $8 million. It's costing them their share of that, okay. which is a lot We can smaller. break it down to the average homeowner with an <clears throat> increase in their appraisal, you know, just well, know that, they're, that that's there. I guess maybe in May, once you get your preliminary property values, yeah. uh, we can you get yeah. more yeah. accurate. You get, least, yeah, yes. you get yeah. more accurate. Yeah picture of what's going to happen. And we really apologize for taking a lot of your time, but no, we no, thought no, it was no, time no, to start fine. talking Thank about you. these yes. issues that we hear, right? Every day we get emails and we try yes, to... Yes, absolutely. Know. We appreciate it. I, I think you should also uh, keep track of those bills that might be impactful, uh, yes. particularly yes. for families that have fixed incomes because they're being 
hurt tremendously with high costs, expenses Inflation. everywhere. Yes. And, and I agree, you know, we need to be careful Definitely. where we provide the relief or whether we keep it or not, but we need to be very careful about it. Yes, yes. In regards to what Mr. Castillo mentioned about watching bills, last time you mentioned a bill that was going to be very hurtful to the district that you all were watching. I don't remember what it was, but you said you were going to be watching it real carefully. I don't remember which, what it was. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was something yeah. that you said, oh, if this passes, it was it's... under CNI. Was it under CNI? Oh, yeah. It's be, oh, okay. Yeah. So was it you? Yeah, okay. The discipline one, one. Was, was it like the vaping, vaping and... and yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay, okay, because that one was a scary one, I remember yes. they said. Okay, and super yes. quickly, and I know I've mentioned it before, on the health insurance, and you see that deficit. I have mentioned before, and I don't know if the district's just not open to it or it doesn't work for the district, but like at Webb County, those of us that work for Webb County, we enjoy our, our health yes. clinic. And our health clinic at first, a lot of people didn't have a lot of faith in it until it was only given three days, you know, and like partial days, right, a couple of hours. Um, and now it's full time. It has worked as a cost saving um, clinic for the county and employees use it all the time. I use it, uh, not too much, but when I have to, I do. Um, and so basically, we have nurse practitioners who are under a, an MD, and then it's only to employees and their dependents who are on the insurance, and they can go for any reason, co any reason, any medical reason. I think they're even gonna open up a lab in the future where you could go for blood work. But right now, you know, you have a cold, you have strep, you have COVID, you go to the clinic, you pay nothing, they give you a prescription, and you go to HEB, so they save money, and then the employee doesn't have to pay a copay. So I, I don't is, know if that's something. Is, is that something UIC can do? Or? As a district? Well, well, we have considered, and, and then COVID came, right? Yes. Uh, we, we considered a, an MOU with Gateway to allow our, because we have registered nurses in each of our campus yes. sites, right? And so this MOU was going to allow them to do uh, different tests, like for the students. Of course, we had to get the parent permission. So maybe we can resurrect that MOU kind we of strip test. Well, right, do exactly. prescription. I think Sam's correct. The, the, what's driving our, our, our increase in costs is the pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. huge. Uh, but another thing that I've run into is there is a, a lack of knowledge on the, from the employee side as to where to go, what to do, you know, what is a, what is a, a you know, in network versus out of network, you know, just all these little, little things that and they don't know. And, and if, I just think we need to start reaching out not only to the committee but to right. the employees you themselves. A lot, a lot more push because there is there is a lot of there is a lot of confusion when it comes to what you can and cannot do in the policy. And I, I, I'll admit I've never read my my health care policy completely, and so I don't know all the intricacies of what's free, what's what's not. Mm -hmm. And you know, for example, I know uh, Clear Choice just just came into network as of March first. Not only the facility, but their but their physicians and their, and their personnel are all in the network now under Blue Cross, which is a huge benefit to to uh, the community, to our, our teachers and our staff and our employees. And then you go to some of these other, you know, standalone clinics like like uh, Stat. Stat yeah. and, well, they may not charge you a copay. They do now. They they're going to charge you. They're going to charge you the the regular costs, not not the uh, not the reduced rates and. So it, it, at the end of the day, it hurts our employees more. Right. But there's just a lot of things right. that our employees don't know. And I, I run into that all the time. Yes, and, and so, so one of the we'll, things we'll, that we'll we had ahead. spoken about, Mr. Gonzalez, was there's not all campuses have the strep throat testing at the nurse station. Uh, if you remember when we were meeting with the departments, yeah. we learned about that. And that's something that we were going to work on making sure instead of sending the child straight to the doctor's office because they're coughing or anything that they can get tested at the school, at the nurse's station, so that we can know exactly what's going on with the We're looking at expanding to a regional campus. Yeah, and, and even taking that a step further, and if we do that with Gateway, the nurse practitioner could give the prescript, I was going to say script, the prescription Same. to take it to the pharmacy, and then they, because, you know, they already know they have strep, so just exactly. send them off. And, yeah. you know. exactly. and, and Webb County does an excellent job of, of 
uh, informing um, employees of what to do and when to do. And they, they send out workshops. this thing. They yeah. have, have workshops. They'll go to your department. Yeah. They'll tell you go to X hospital versus Y hospital. Go to X clinic versus Y clinic. Stay away from this one because your copay is going to be crazy. We're not going to cover you here. And so literally when you have something, you look at this list and it tells you what you should do. Especially since we're self-funded, I think that's just, I just think we need to, and, you know, and if you look at the, uh, at, at some of the, the most, the, the more popular illnesses that we have, so to speak, you know, the flu and the strep and the, you know, COVID, we're in the season. you know, you start concentrating on those, I'm sure you'll, you'll see some of the reduced rates. Mm -hmm. Do, I have a question. Pregnancy? The nurse practitioner, do we have a nurse practitioner at UIC, or that's what she's saying with Gateway? We, we actually have registered nurses yeah. in each of our campuses. Right? So they can prescribe them? Well, to I, I think with, with this right. MOU, from what I remember, oh, because it was a on. couple of years ago, um, I think we they, they can use a doctor from Gateway to get the, you know, give them the symptoms. It, it was going to work through our nurses, yes. but through Gateway doctors. Yes. Or yeah. physician assistant. But we have right. actual kits at the schools yeah. to test the, the children. Yeah, I think that's only to test. But I think to give a person, you need to be you a know, nurse you, practitioner. Yeah, so, yeah. so yeah. like, my, um, what I'm asking if they can do it to is because if we can do our own, let's say, building. They don't take as much as this to do something like that. And they, they can go pick them up, come over here, and, and get tested. And then they can go to HEB. Because I go to the county, I pay $6. And uh, not, not at the county, at the pharmacy. At the pharmacy, sorry. The pharmacy. So yeah. they sent me to the pharmacy with my insurance at $6. Yeah. You know, in two days I'm ready. My daughter goes back to school. Yeah. That's going to improve the attendance. Yeah. That's something I can yeah. do. So, and then also the district makes money out of their own insurance. Because the, the, that's my understanding. The county makes millions of dollars with the insurance. The own employees going to the, to the something that we can look at. I think yeah, they, they build themselves, right? Themselves. They build yes. themselves. Something, something my like my that. understanding yeah. is that they made $5 million. Mr. Yeah. Aguilar, to answer your question, I wouldn't see any legal issue with doing a similar program like Web. Oh, oh okay. Because oh, it's a school district. But what if we made no money off of it? We just yeah, but we money. can tie it to the public purpose of you know better morale for our teachers, better right. attendance by our teachers. Yeah, right. We're saving money through the insurance yeah. program, et cetera. So, so, educational. Yeah, educational, exactly. keeping people in school, so helping MOU? our ADA. Mm -hmm. MO, okay. And MOU would be better. Yeah, I, yeah. you know, it's a, a good... That's a, that's a loaded question. There's all the finances involved. <laughs> oh, okay. An MOU versus <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, okay. a facility. Okay. Okay. But they're good yeah, 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 yeah. Not yeah. an MOU, we but a financial up. agreement. So there you to go. follow up, you know. Okay. Thank you. Lots of thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> Next adjournment? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Agenda item, right? Agenda item 4B, 2023-2024, pre-kinder full day expansion. Hi, good evening, uh, Mr. Castillo, Mr. Montemayor, Ms. Oliveros, Ms. Molina, and Mr. Aguilar, welcome. Uh, for the record, Rebecca Morales, Assistant Superintendent for Administration and Policies. So I'm bringing before you an informational item to talk about our full day pre-K uh, expansion. This information was brought to you back in maybe July of last year. Some of you were here, some of you were not. Um, but back in 2019, after House Bill 3 was passed, uh, we were required to provide full day pre-kindergarten to all eligible four-year-old students in the district. Now, we were allowed the opportunity to apply for exemptions, and um, we did, right? And, and the exemption conditions were they were granted if the district would have to would be required to construct classrooms, repurpose classrooms, uh, or issue bonds in order to provide these services, or the implementation of a full day program would result in fewer eligible children being enrolled in the pre-kindergarten uh, pre pre program. Can we go to the next slide? So we are in the last year of being able to offer any other uh, program other than a full day program for pre -kinder. Okay, now, I kind of wanted to go over a little bit what the eligibility is. It's not automatic for all students that are four-year-old uh, students in the district that would qualify for pre-kinder. So these are the eligibility, um, these are the requirements in order for the students to be eligible for the program. So unable to speak and comprehend uh, the English language, educationally disadvantaged, uh, homeless, a child of an active duty member, uh, the child a member of an armed, armed forces, including uh, someone who was injured or killed while, while serving on duty, or if they are in foster care. So if we go to the next slide. Do they have to be enrolled in the McKinney program? They do not, but that is one of the eligibility um, uh, 
I, they, they would be eligible if they are in the McKinney Venture Program, automatically. Okay. Now I want to show, uh, show you where we have full day programs currently, and, and I do have to highlight our Head Start programs, and Thank we're you. very appreciative of the partnership that we have with our Head Start. So as you can see, all of those campuses around the school district have full day programs this school year, this is this school year, and of course in many of these campuses we do have um, the Head Start program as well. Now, we go to, now, if you look at the location of uh, a lot of these schools, you see that most of these schools are, of course, uh, in the south side. And, of course, we do have Muller Elementary over there in the Mines Road area. We do have Newman Elementary as well at Finley that is in the Mines Road. But most of these campuses are the LBJ or the United South High School Theater Center. Okay? Now, we go to the next slide. This is where we're currently offering half-day programs. Okay? So we have Borchers Colonel. Dejano, Faskin, uh, Malakoff, Nye, Robert, uh, Roberto Santos, San Isidro, and Trotman Elementary. Next slide. And now these are the campuses where we do not have a pre-K program because these campuses are actually clustered with another campus. So for example, at Bonnie Garcia, we don't have a pre-K program, but those students are offered pre uh, full day pre-K at Zafari. Salinas, we don't have a program, but those students go to Ruiz and so on. As you'll see down the list, all of these campuses don't necessarily have it at their site, but we do offer the program at a cluster site, what we call it. And we do offer transportation for these students, uh, again, and for students that are eligible. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Oh, there's transportation available? Yes, and then they go back to their campuses okay. as kindergartners. Now, this is our, uh, the proposal uh, that was shared back in, like I said, July. I know this has been a topic of conversation for some time because we knew that this date was coming. Uh, so this is, uh, this is our plan for this coming school year for 23-24 uh, for those sites that do not currently have a pre-K program and are running a half-day program currently. So we have Nye, who would be the hosting campus for Trotman, so Nye and Trotman, and we've looked at, we have to look at classroom availability. Are we able to service these students and projected enrollment, of course. So uh, we, have, we need four classrooms to run the program at Nye or for Nye and Trotman, and we actually have five classrooms available there. Uh, for Matias, that would be the hosting campus, and they would uh, they would host Borchers. We need two classrooms there based on projected enrollment, and we have six. At Roberto Santos, that would host Colonel Santos. We need four classrooms. We have 18, so more than more than we need. At Malakoff, uh, that would be the hosting campus, and they would host uh, San Isidro. We need four classrooms there. We have 12 classrooms available. And last, Baskin, again, because of the location, we would host a standalone full-day pre-K program there. We need one classroom and we do have four classrooms available. So that is our plan for this coming school year. We're actually working on a, a new marketing campaign for pre-K, and uh, I know that Susan is here with us, and, and she was recording at, at Trotman Elementary this morning. We're changing our whole roundup, uh, and we're moving it to uh, your dreams begin here at United ISD. So we're promoting you know, our future teachers and our future lawyers and our future doctors, uh, and so we're really pushing that new Slogan and, and that new, um, it's kind of like a new fresh, a new fresh campaign to get our, our pre-K students enrolled. We actually, for the first time, are gonna be running a, a, an enrollment campaign, an enrollment fair for pre-K, and possibly even expand it to kinder. Uh, we're hosting it at Nye Elementary on, on April the 15th. We're gonna be doing, we're coordinating with CNI to do all the testing that is required for students that are eligible for pre-K, so that the parents, it will be convenient for our parents, and we can get them enrolled in, one location. Awesome. So, so are, the, are we fully funded for that ADA or are they only fund half, half day? They fund half day. Half day. There are several bills out sure, there we'll that we're hoping okay. will, uh, because there is actually another bill and that, that doesn't have to do with funding but will, will impact our pre-kindergarten numbers which is a bill that would assist us with our retention okay. and our recruitment. I can't remember the number right now but that bill, if passed, um, it would require us to offer the pre-K program to non-eligible students if they are the son, uh, the child of uh, an employee. Oh, so that'd be good. It would be great. We just need the we do need the money. Yeah, <laughs> we do need the money. And, and and that's where I mean, it's not that we're biased to the south, but that's where the socioeconomic uh, need is, and so that's where Head Start can come in and right. supplement because. You know, there's, there's also quite qualifying factors for We have a lot more students that do qualify, and of course we, we have the federal projected enrollments, and you know, once, once we do start the, the registration project process, which opens April the 3rd, we'll have a better idea of how many students, and once we start testing them. Let's not forget about the he West Side. classrooms at all his PK schools. What is the, uh, excuse me, sorry, what is the tool for 
unable to speak and comprehend English language. They're, what is they're Spanish speakers. Mostly Spanish speakers are another language, but they're not they're not English speakers. So um, typically, when they answer on like a whole language survey, that the students are Spanish speakers, or that they or that Spanish is spoken at the home, um, then that that kind of prompts that. That and it's actually the, it's actually one of the eligibilities. Is it based on the application? The Their self, registration. Self registration. Right. I, I, does uh, Kenny Zapata and Wise Linky? I saw I said no. Is that true? No, no. They don't have a Head Start program, but they do have it. We can go yeah. back. Sam, oh, it's one more. Days. Yeah, they, they've had full day for, for a can while. Can go back? Yeah. Uh, one more. Oh. Uh, head Start. They're not right. Head start. Those are head so start? They, have, they don't have a Head Start program, but they do have a, a, a UIC full day pre-K okay. program. Yeah. yeah. And wow. the reason, and, and the district makes money off a of Head Start. I think right now we're giving over half a billion dollars. Yes. Yes. Um, but the reason is because those are older schools and their classrooms are small and they don't meet the requirements that Head Start mandates for the square footage per child. Because we've considered um, doing, I mean, we could reduce the class size, but I don't know if that'll work for, for UISD, but we'd be getting money from well, Head Start. Well, yeah, and we actually do have some sites, and, and I, I want to say it's either, it, it's Case and I believe, or Finley, uh, Finley, where we have to keep those class sizes really small at 17 instead of 20, yes. but because there's no room. There's so no it, it wouldn't, right. it, we prefer to have the the, class, the bigger class sizes so we can service obviously more That's students. That's why we haven't done those the cash. Yeah. We want to, but we can't. Yes. Yeah. So thank you all so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Moving on to agenda item 4C, um, after school adventures program tuition increase. Welcome, you get to bring, sorry that you're not here. First meeting, you get to bring some bad news. Yes. Don't shoot the messenger, right? Don't shoot the messenger. Welcome. Thank you. Good and congratulations to the, the board. Thank you. And Mr. Gonzalez, my name is Andrea Ramirez, Executive Director for Federal Programs. And uh, this evening, I'm bringing an informational item on uh, pertaining to the After School Adventures Program. And we are looking to raise tuition by $25 for the next school year. A little bit about the program. It's, um, the After School Adventure Program right now currently services 21 campuses across uh, the district. It is solely tuition based. Right now we've been charging $125 a month for families. Um, we try to keep the ratio of, of students, teachers, it's 15 to 1, so 15 students to one caregiver. We have um, experienced some increases in expenditures. Um, some of the examples of some of the increases have been that we now have a police officer at each of our sites for added safety and security. We also have had to, we've raised the pay from $9 to $12 for the caregivers for after school. So uh, we have seen that, that trend of increased expenses. The chart that you see here is uh, projections of revenues and expenditures over a five year period. So if you look at the yellow where it has the 125 monthly fee and you start looking at the year 2023 right now and the years to come, you'll notice that our expenditures um, oversee the uh, revenues that, are bring, that we're bringing in. So we are looking to raise it by $25, 150 a month, and we feel that that will continue to help us uh, service our students effectively and efficiently. Do they get a discount if they have more than one child in this program? I, I no, think that that is the... No, they do not. So if they have two children, they went up 100 bucks a month. Uh, you have three kids. $50. $50. $50. $50. Oh, sorry, $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50. $50.
we need to help them because they're making sure this program is working. So we're not. It, that, the <laughs> we're better off than we were back in the beginning. Yes, it's good. Hard work. But it did help us tremendously because if you all remember, we had brought this informational item to you all. We were at about a thousand students on the wait list. We were struggling. We were trying everything. <laughs> But that, that uh, pay increase did help us a lot. We're not where we'd like to be, but we're down to about 200 students on the wait list from 1,000. So we've made a lot of gains and a lot of improvements. But well, we have to be able to sustain that increase. And, and like Mr. Amiras mentioned, you know, the also the, we didn't have security. I mean, not security, but we didn't have police officers at every campus. But we know that is a high priority yes. for the district and for our community. So that's something that we're also committing to. Are, are, we pay, are they our own employees and we're paying no, them right. extra? Our own employees? Yes. Uh, the same school, maybe? Because they yes, know the kids? To, yes, we try to, to, to keep our, our police officers from the same campus. And sometimes when they're not willing to work, or they don't no longer want to work our program, we work very well with Chief Salazar to you know help us move people around that are interested in, in working so that they can be assigned to the campus and then stay. Because they're already off the clock by this time, or what? They get over yes, time. they get over time. How many uh, understaff uh, positions do we have? Or? How many vacancies? Up the vacancies it, it varies by campus. So it, it, the, uh, out of the 200 students, I, it, it would be easy to just say 200 divided by the 15, our ratio, or 18. But it just depends on the grade levels. Like we can't bring, if we have 10 students on a wait list, but they're from mm -hmm. kindergarten to fifth grade, we can't necessarily bring them all in if we hire one staff member because it, we put them in age-appropriate groups. Mm -hmm. So it, it just varies. It's gonna vary. It varies by campus. So as a, as a parent with the kids help. in the, the, this program, I can tell you, yeah, it's an increase. But still, sure. it, there's, there's a lot that they're receiving mm -hmm. from teacher aides, from security. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, it, it's a lot. So the, it's still a huge benefit to have them enrolled in this program. It's a lot less expensive than regular day. Yeah. And also, they're doing their homework. They're learning English because they're yes. talking to the peers they're working and stuff with teacher like aides. that. Yes, well, I think that's very good. good. What is the age requirement? Is this for pre-K also? Pre -K? Pre-K to fifth grade. Yes, elementary. What was the program you said the value uses that's free? It's the 21st century program. It's like the one that we have at the LBJ Theater Pattern Campuses, the grant that we applied for, which I don't know if you all remember, I actually brought it to you a couple of months ago. We applied for another grant. We're hoping that we can expand the services and we get uh, funding for it. But that's our, it's a 21st century grant, is what it's called, 21st CCLC, okay. which we have. We have, and, but only certain campuses have. Only, eight only eight campuses, which are the LBJ theater campus. Okay. Did you apply for other? We did apply for other schools. Okay. Hopefully, we got it. Thank you. There you go. That's what we did. Good job. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Guys. You should have started with that. <laughs> Moving on to agenda item 4D, notice of grant applications that may be submitted on behalf of the district. Good evening, board members, Ms. Olveros, and everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Ian Glandon. I'm here to present to you the uh, grant applications that we submitted on behalf of the district this month. We're looking at the Dyslexia Grants Award Program for local education agencies in the amount of $218,847. We're also looking at the Innovative Services for Students with Autism for the 2023-2024 school year in the amount of about $270,000. There's also the Jobs in Education for Texans Grant that's from the Texas Workforce Commission, that's coming in at under $350,000. And we're looking at a federal grant, Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health Program, and that one is an amount to be determined. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are just applications, right? Right. These are new grants, or these are renewal grants? These are all new grants. Well, okay, and some re some repeaters, but no renewals. Okay. I just wanted, I'm a new board member, but I, I see all your work you've done, so I just want to thank you for everything you've done. Thank and you, you very, very much. This month. And I, I do want to say one thing. I have to go into my, I'm looking at the superintendent, because it's always saying wrap it up like that. Yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, we, it's, it is truly, truly a team effort, and one of the things we're doing with our new administration, and I've been at this a long time, since 2002, doing grants, it's really a team effort. We don't do anything alone. And even when, I'm going to show you in a minute how we go about the grants process. When we find out grants, we look for grants. Everybody in this room looks for grants. Yes. They hear about grants from various sources. 
And if send it to Dr. Landon, by the way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know. Let's shop around and see if it's good for us. We'll look at it, and then we we'll go after it. And even if we go after it, I may think it's a great brand, but then I hand it off to the experts. They say, you know, okay, it sounds good, but, or here's what we have to go to it. And then if it's something that we want to go for, we have to make sure what's about it. And then what's about it, if it's good, we try it. And then I start making everybody crazy with what we need. And then with Mr. Aranda's transportation department, they're wonderful to work with as his chief auto owns uh, police department. You want something done, call the cops. <laughs> hey guys, I need some crazy information you would never think to look for. Here you go, boom. And we get funded, it's wonderful. But that's the next presentation. But thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, moving on to the next item. Agenda item E, Grants Administration Department Overview Processes and Year-to-Date Grants. Okay, uh, good evening again, board members, and this is what we're gonna do. And this, grant, this, this presentation is about really what we do and how we do it. And what we do, I had a whole different concept for my presentation, which was about nine slides. And thanks to Mr. Flores, he said, let's review that and then for the second time, wrap it up. Wrap it up. Oh, let's do it in one. Okay, so, yeah, <laughs> to the point. So first what we do is we find and review the grant opportunities, and we look at various places, such as the Federal Register, the Texas Register, the TPA announcements, and other funder announcements, and then share from other staff, question mark. This comes in that they may find it through their professional applications. We'll even chase things down that, hey, I was at a conference and I heard. We will chase things down. We'll chase rumors down. It doesn't matter. Um, once we find the announcement, we go back to the funder, pull the application, what is it they're asking us for? Does, this, does the grant application align with what the district, the program, and the student goals and needs are? It may be a wonderful grant, but if it's not what we need at the moment or the direction we're going, the days are over when we get, you know, remember the guy with the question marks on his suit? Uh, free money from the government. That was a new. And y'all know, anybody who's worked with the grant knows. It, it, it doesn't work that way. So we make sure it aligns with our district and especially our student goals and needs. What are the requirements for that? What do we have to do to get that money? And then what are the strings attached? Do we have to give matching funds? It's a big one now, especially from the feds. Even very interesting grants, like uh, we were talking about the JET grant that we want to pursue. It's from the Texas Workforce Commission. They know they want to give us the money. They know it's for a good reason. But they're saying you have to match it with 5% of the cost of the new equipment. That's great, I don't have a problem with it, but again, as part of the teamwork, I've talked to these science people. I said, okay, do we have that money available? Because I'll call up the department, they have it in their budget, but I still have to remember budget is the plan for how we spend our money. There's not anybody in here with a budget who says, yeah, I got, you know, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars unspent at this stage of the game. Nobody has that right now. So I have to verify with them, sure, go and make sure we have it more ready to roll. Now, and the strings of cash, or what do we have to do to get it? What are you going to need from us? One of the things that comes up, even on a beautiful grant, like a, a grant to hire police officers, the cops hiring grant to federal grant. Well, for three years, they'll pay the salaries of a certain number of officers, but each year, we have to give them part of the money, for instance. The first year, they'll give us 75% of that officer's salary. We match 25%. The second year, we have to increase more. So they'll give us 50%. The third year, we have to give about 75% so much as a sliding scale. Okay, fair. But then we have to keep them on staff full time at our pay for three years after that. So we have to commit to that. Now, I, I see our wonderful attorneys are present, and I'm pretty sure there's something about we can't commit our money or budget in advance, and that's beyond me. But I don't think finance people worry about that. So, moving on. To, that's fine, yeah. We're not, we're not going to worry about that yet. So we have to have all these things in mind about if we accept this money, what are we committing ourselves to in the future? In the future? Then we have to share the opportunity around. Send the opportunity, okay, here's what we can do. It looks like it's in line with what we want to do. It fits our goals and needs. Whatever the requirement of us we can do, and we know what's required with the strings attached. Do we want to do it or not? Okay, yes, we do want to pursue it. Okay, let's make sure. Let me talk to the people who are the professionals with their boots on the grounds. I can sit in my office all day, not talk to anybody, use secondary data, write beautiful grants that will be funded. But the moment we take it to instruction or to transportation and give it to them and say, here's a grant that I thought would be great for you, if it doesn't meet their needs, I'm just wasting their time and wasting their opportunity. I have to show the respect of the teamwork to the people who are the experts to get their information 
and make sure that whatever we're doing for them meets what they want. And it goes back to the buses. One of the wonderful things about the bus grant was they were saying we could get uh, clean burning electric buses, was it Joe, or something they wanted us to write for? We could have electric buses. It sounds wonderful. They don't make them for Texas. Mm -hmm. Gee, thank you. Thank you very much. So I could have written beautiful grants for electric buses that could have been funded. We wouldn't have a way to fuel them. So we'd be sitting there gathering dust. So we can't do that. So we get everybody with all their expertise in, all together, making a decision what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it. Once we decide that, we name a project leader, which is going to be my point of contact for who I'm going to go through. Because I can make everybody say, we're going to do this all together, but then, all right, I need a little bit of data about a single commitment for what we're going to do for committing some, some um, matching fees. Or there's somebody who's got to commit that, yes, indeed, we'll be making a report every month about how we use this large equipment. Well, that's our project leader. We're going to go after that. We establish the timeline of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. We develop that. We develop and design the grant program, the who, what, when, where, and how, and we finalize the plans and the tentative budget for the application that we're going to be making. This is where we're really planning everything about the grant. We put it all in the application, and then the one, two, three, fourth one, we submit the application. Once the application goes in, sometimes we're asked to conduct negotiations with the funder. They take in our application, maybe they liked it. And they said, you know what? Here's the thing. You asked for, like in our case, we asked for 30 buses. But because of some technicalities, they would not allow us to get money back for one bus. Why? Because on that one bus, there was an a engine plate family code that we didn't have. And we said, OK, well, we're going to get you that number. We could never get them that number. Why not? Not because anybody was lazy, not because somebody didn't want to go take a photo, but because in our interest of serving the needs of being frugal and being good stewards of the public money and making sure our kids have safe buses, that bus was a good bus, but the engine had given out. So transportation had made a decision to go and get a rebuilt, take out the bad engine, get a rebuilt engine, and put it in. The new rebuilt engine no longer had an engine family code plate on it because by definition it had been rebuilt. So we had to let the funder know that. They said, okay, well that one bus, we're sorry, it's off the list. But I was, I was really impressed with how we're going this extra mile to make sure we've got good engines for our students. Good engines for our buses to keep our students <coughs> safe on the road, even if it's to the point that it would not qualify for that. Can we see the both rents that we received already? Is that better? So? Pardon? The rents that we've uh, received. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, let's go this okay. I'm a little bit proud of this. Um, I'm not going to read you all of these. But I do want to point out some of these grants. This is going back to the year 2022 and 2023. I want to point out the third one down, COVID-19 school health grant cycle two, 1.8 million, almost 1.9. And um, one day I'll tell you the long story about that one. Um, but that was fun. We worked on that together. There was completely about five of us. And then you go down the early college high school grant, 175,000. You'll notice that the Perkins Career and Technology Grant and the two special eds, the Consolidated Formula, formula Grant and the Preschool, those are formula grants, but we, my office assists with them. And we're happy to do that. We also assist in the reporting for them. So that's just one way we can provide a service to everybody. And then we also have provided the Texas COVID Learning Assistance and Support After School Grant that, that supports federal programs in that. That was 800, 812,500. And then our ever popular clean school bus grant. Now, and then at the very, very bottom, this one, the Texas State Energy Conservation Office, Chiller's Loans for Schools. That one was really special to, to work with. Even though it's a loan, it goes through a similar process to the grants so we're able to work with facilities to submit that. And that's going to be some, Mr. Wright Health Department was able to work with us and we were able to help prepare the documents so that we're able to get Chiller's for Schools to replace, you know, to put in good air conditioning at a rate that will save so much money that it's going to pay off the loans. And I don't remember what schools that was for, sir. All the high schools. All the high schools. Mm -hmm. And again, this comes down to when the state gives you money, there's going to be photographs and evidence and how documentation that thing. But it's, the nice thing is we get to become um, mini experts at the moment. But it's always a pleasure. It's always fun. And um, I have a very good staff, Ms. Eva Barrera and Ms. Viviana 
Sanchez, who I promised I would say she's getting married at the end of the month, so everybody keeps oh, wishing well. Congratulations to her. It's always a pleasure, and thank you very much. Thank I hope you. If there's any questions. If not now, please call me up, 6402. That was as quick as I could do it, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. He did awesome. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Okay, moving on to F. Um, if we could do it just as quickly, December end, of course, results. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, members of the board, Mr. Gonzalez. My name is Laura Vasquez. I'm the Director of Student Assessment. And today, I'm here to present our fall comparison for our STAR EOC scores. As you know, our students in the high schools tested this December with our, what we call our old STAR test, because in spring, we will have our new STAR 2.0 assessment. And we just wanted to show, uh, share with you some of the comparisons as far as 2021 and now 2022. There have been a couple of um, changes this year with House Bill 4545, where students have now been uh, given an extra um, opportunity to be able to uh, work in smaller groups with their teachers and be able to enhance their skills to, again, make sure that they're, they're progressing in their STAR scores. So this is just a brief overview, but if we go, this is actually our first time <coughs> testers, which is students that have never taken an EOC before. But if we go to the next page, we can actually see a comparison as we compare from our district to our region and the state. So in our district for English one, and, and I won't go through all of them, but just to, so that you know, in English one for our first time testers at approaches, which is our passing standard, we had an 84% of our students meet that standard compared to the region, which was at a 64%. And if we scroll a little bit down, we do have our state, which is at 56. So our district is doing very, very well in all of our state assessments. Now, if we go to the next page, you can see, oh. Uh oh, that's it, we're done. Okay. <laughs> I don't see another page. Okay, there was supposed to be another page with all of our scores trust here. Yes, so. but we're doing a great job. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. For the most part, we're ahead of the region, the state. Yeah. Uh, maybe right now with the high school scores. Yeah, Dr. Simmons mentioned we're above region. Yes, so that's very good. Okay, moving on. Agenda item five. The following items are to be reviewed by board members, by members of the board, with recommendations for action to be made. Uh, agenda item 5A, discussion regarding monthly disbursements. Is yes, that um, again, the Division of Finance presents you all with the, with the prior month, which is February, for your review. Do you all have any questions over any disbursements for the month? No questions. No questions. Thank you. Moving on, agenda item 5B, discussion regarding property tax refunds for the month of February 2023. Good evening, the Board of Trustees. I'm here to present you the February 2023 refunds. Uh, we have a, a total of three for $12,445.31. At this time, there is no loss of revenue to the district. These accounts are paid in full. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Moving on, agenda item 5C, discussion regarding low attendance waivers, remote conferencing elementary schools. And if we could do all of them, D, discussion regarding low attendance yeah. waiver, remote conferencing and e. secondary schools. And E, yeah. discussion of awarding bids, proposals, and qualifications. Ms. Well, yes. well, D and E are, are the same, the low attendance waivers, remote conferencing. Uh, D is the elementary schools, and there's a list of the schools in the days that we're uh, asking for a waiver. Mm -hmm. And in uh, the secondary, there's also mm -hmm. about 14 schools that we're asking for waivers, and there's various dates. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Okay. So did you do a discussion of awarding bids, proposals, and qualifications? Okay, okay. no, yeah. Nice. Five E. Good evening, um, Cordy Jackson for the record. I'll be quick Hello to everyone. Um, the first recommendation is RFQ, which is Request for Qualification 001-2023. This is Energy um, Engineering Consultant Services. The recommended vendor is TESI, which is Texas Energy um, Engineering Services, the most qualified. If we're unable to negotiate a contract with them, we're bringing Ethos Engineering as the second most qualified um, company. We also have um, RFP 2022-063 Web Filtering Solutions. The recommended vendor is Content Keeper Technologies and the estimated annual amount is $116,750. And then we have one renewal for your consideration, which is our Armored Car Services. Are we hiring um, This is for Mr. <coughs> this is an engineer to do the um, solar project, right? 
No, the Lone Star. The Lone Star. Yeah, it, it would be for, for specialized projects such as mm -hmm. solar panels, you know, campuses, uh, projects uh, financed through the CEQA, the Lone Star program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Those are the, the grants that were presented. Yeah, the next yeah. Grant. And then the next two agenda items are both um, requesting to um, use competitive sealed proposals as the method of procurement for two projects. I don't know if you want me to just go through both of them. Um, and so the first project is the construction of a new baseball field at Alexander High School. That's the first agenda item. And then the next agenda item is the reconstruction of a new staff parking lot at Newman Elementary School. And so it's two separate agenda items, but they're both for the same thing. It's just asking you to use CSP as a method of procurement for both of those projects. And once we procure them, then we'll bring them back for your approval. Sure. Absolutely. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, F, discussion regarding CSP competitive. We're at H, actually. She did. She did. I did. did. Yeah. Why am I only stuck? We're on H. We're on H. Discussion regarding requests from board members in regards to use of board discretionary funds. Mr. Mike. Chairman, uh, uh, members of the board, might not be the quickest. There is no additional item. Oh. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you very much. Likewise. Okay. Thank, thank you. I. Right. Does he have funds? Yes, he does. Uh, he has a smile, so I think he does. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Molina had, a, yes. had an available balance, and we rolled them into his account. Okay. Agenda item I, discussion regarding employment contracts, addendums, letters of assurances for 23-24 school works last year. Good evening, Dave Canales for the record. Um, good evening, more members of the Dallas and members of the audience. It's that time of year again, we bring up to you uh, the approved employment contracts, addendums, and letters of assurance for the 23-24 school year, which includes one-year term contracts, probationary contracts, non-certified professional contracts, retiree hire, addendums, certification addendum, district innovation addendums, notice of assignment of exam personnel to supplemental pay, and for the paraprofessional area would be the reason, reasonable assurance of employment art. Attorney did review all this, and so it was just here to make sure that we can share them with you. So you can yeah, these are just the forms that we use on an annual basis and review on an annual basis. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? Very good, okay. Um, Jay, discussion regarding the sale or disposition of salvage furniture and equipment. Good evening, board members, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, members of the audience. At this time, we bring before you the recommendation to approve the disposal of the listed surplus items by the methods outlined in the resolution at an upcoming uh, auction. auction. <coughs> Any questions? Thank you very much. You have a Thank you. The, you have a list of the things. Yes, sir. The list is it's attached by category, sir. It's, it's at the very end. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And six, well, we don't have to motion, do we? Make a motion we to do. adjourn, Any yes, motion? yes. Second. Uh, motion passes, it is 725. Thank you.